So maybe I'll start off. <clears throat> okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's special COVID council meeting. And normally, yes, we do them in the evening. We're doing them in the afternoon now. Uh, it's a lot easier with our IT staff in the room with us to help us through this process. And they're gonna explain a little bit better to those of you listening in, those of you at home, we're zooming in and uh, we're we're gonna have a combination of Zooming and then we've got WeStream providing live streaming and our staff will explain exactly how that's gonna to work tonight. So before we get started to uh, an adoption of the minutes from our April 2nd meeting, 2020, moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Thompson. If there's no changes, <laughs> he beat you by half a hand. If there's no changes, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. Uh, now we're looking for disclosures of a pecuniary interest for today's meeting for Tuesday, April the 1st. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, a couple of checks to my employer 00274-0001 and 00269-0009. And are we still uh, scribing to the clerk? Mr. Do we clerk. We still have to hand that sheet of paper in? Yes. All right. No problem. Just leave it on your desk. Okay. Councillor Campbell. Yes, uh, yeah. Report F 2023. Could you say that word one more time, please? <laughs> <laughs> For those of you watching, remuneration is one of the hardest words. Sometimes it doesn't flow at all. So, what was the word again? I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Councillor Campbell. Any other declarations? Uh, Councillor Lococo. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry I must have missed that, but I'm sure I have something, so I'll go back and I'll, I'll bring it up later. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. We're good for now for disclosures. Okay, moving along the agenda is the mayor's reports and announcements. Of course, everyone's favorite part of the meeting. Would you like to do okay? Uh, but just before we do everyone's favorite part of the meeting, thank you for that, uh, Mr. Clerk. Maybe we should start with O Canada, uh, the national anthem. So if I could ask everybody to please stand and we're gonna have a recording and I'm gonna read it just before we start. I'm sorry. Uh, today's version of O Canada has been pre-recorded. Uh, is that right, Mr. Uh, Clerk? Uh, by Ella Sacco. Ella is 12 years old. She's a grade six student at Notre Dame Elementary School here in Niagara Falls. She's an avid dancer with Infin Infinite Motion Dance Studio. She's often in theatrical performances with Linusan Productions. Like most of us, she's finding lots of ways to stay engaged during the quarantine time. She loves doing her online assignments and video chatting with her friends. She's even doing virtual dance lessons online, as well as cooking, baking, playing games at home with her parents and with her brother. She says she's doing her part to stay home and crush the curve. So Mr. Clerk, let's listen to Ella Sacco sing the national anthem. Do we need to plug them in? Okay, bear with us. We're going to uh, put our speaker on so those of us here in chambers can actually hear the music. And you can see Ella's got that beautiful sign on the mantle of her fireplace, crush the curve. Of course, that's our goal. Reason being, we, we know we have to flatten the curve and our approach is let's, flat, let's crush it instead. Pecuniary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe you were anticipating the fact that it wouldn't work, and that's why we didn't have the anthem going. But <laughs> we'll uh, we'll have to go without. We thought this would be a great idea to have someone pre-record okay. and send it in. I think what I'll do, I uh, f just for the sake of the fact that she went through so much trouble to get this done. I will send the video out to all of council so you guys can okay. see and maybe offer your own congratulations yeah. for the next meeting. Yeah, we'll yeah. see if we can get it going for the next one. We'll do. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay.
So why don't we, for now, everyone just bow their head. We'll just have a quiet reflection, and uh, we're going to have her play Ella sing for us at the next council meeting. And as you're bowing your head, moment of reflection, thank you for Councillor Carrier reminding us for all the victims in Nova Scotia of the horrific event that took place. Our, our thoughts and our prayers are with them at this time. And maybe we can include them in our reflection as we bow our heads for a moment of silence. Thank you very much. <clears throat> also, I should mention, uh, you probably noticed when you came in today, the flags at City Hall are at half mast. Uh, they were originally for the loss of the councillor in Pelham, and uh, now we kept them down for the, the, the victims and the families that were affected by what happened in Nova Scotia the other day. Okay, so moving into the uh, mayor's reports and announcements and we will get Ella up for the next one whether we've got to figure out a way that we can do this and 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 everybody at home that are watching along uh, bear with us we're still trying to figure this out it's a definite uh, work in progress as we're trying to get all technology coming coming across we'll get there so first off we'll start off with obituaries uh, we'd like to acknowledge the loss of Pat Kelly well-loved boxing coach and I know Boxing coach of Councillor Strange and mentor to Councillor Strange, uh, member of the Sports Wall of Fame, and a well-known, well-loved member of our community. So we'll miss Pat. And I understand there will be a service at some point when COVID is behind us and we can properly memorialize him. <clears throat> also, uh, Sam Michelli, brother of Tony Michelli from our arenas, passed away. Charlie Hudson, the uncle of Marianne Tickey of our Municipal Works Department. Mike Ciolfi, the Ward 1 Councillor from the town of Pelham, Enid Shaw, the aunt of former Councillor Joyce Morocco and John Morocco, a retired employee, Bill McMullen, the father of former St. Catharines Mayor Brian McMullen, who also passed away. So our condolences go out to all these and their families. Uh, while we're talking about COVID-19, we'll start off with some good news stories. Uh, the, coming, the, the community has been coming together in a real neat way. And I received a call a couple weeks ago from John McBain. And John, for those of you who are aware, you know, a well-known Niagara Falls entrepreneur. And the McBain Center is named after his parents, former MP. Uh, and uh, we've named a trail after. We had John McBain Day. Uh, obviously, uh, Councillor Thompson was there to help out with that. And, and Family and Children's Services, thank you for a sizable donation. And it's nice that, uh, I'm sorry, how much? 750000 So he, he's done well. He's given back to our community. He hasn't forgotten where he comes from. And he said, I'd like to, my wife and I would like to make some donations to COVID-friendly groups in Niagara Falls. He said, we're going to do the same for Niagara Falls and my wife's community. So he asked us for a list, the CAO and myself, a list of charitable groups that are helping out. And then he picked from the list and determined that he would give a quarter of a million dollars, no questions asked, unsolicited. He gave 125,000 to Project Share, 100,000 to the YWCA, and 25,000 to the Soup Kitchen Niagara Falls Community Outreach. Incredible human being. Uh, the fact that they did that and gave back and without being solicited or asked, pretty amazing. So we just want to call out and, and recognize that great effort. <clears throat> Many, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Councillor Gamble. Sure is. Many of our local businesses and community groups are sharing the crush the curve messages. And if you notice around town, town uh, there are marquees and billboards out front. Many of the churches, service groups, uh, from Fireman's Park to uh, businesses all over the city, they've got crush the curve, uh, hashtag crush the, cur the curve, which is terrific. They're all sharing in it. Van Media and Patterson Signs. Here's another good story. So I spoke to Jimmy Pattison and I asked if they might donate some billboards here in Niagara Falls. And they gave us a whole slew of billboards all around town. And they're paying the full production and installation of the Crush the Curve message, which has on it three main points. Stay home, 
wash your hands and keep your physical distance. Just amazing that they would do that. Also, Van Media uh, has a signed business as well, and he's got two uh, mobile billboards that they're driving around town and they're parking them in different locations for two days at a time where people tend to go on busy intersections. So amazing. Other community donations, uh, former uh, Councillor Morocco was involved in her business, Destination Niagara. They raised 20000 to put toward personal protective equipment. Evertrust Development Group donated 20000 to Project Share. Marine Land Canada donated more than 2,000 masks to community organizations. Signature Signs donated uh, hundreds of masks to local retirement residences. Johnny Rocco's donated more than 3,000 hot pizzas on site at all the hospitals throughout the region for the frontline healthcare workers. The Niagara Industrial Association is alive and well. They raised 110,000 for the Niagara Health Foundation COVID-19 hospital equipment drive. The Rotary of Niagara Falls contributed 3,000 to purchase personal protective equipment for workers at the Salvation Army Eventide Home. So these are just some examples of giving back. We've got people all over the community making masks. They're sewing them in their kitchens, their living rooms. They call them peace of mind masks. People are buying groceries for friends and for neighbors. Uh, they're doing all sorts of things, and this is what's beautiful about Niagara Falls. When the chips are down, people are stepping up, and they're doing for each other. Incredible stories. So yeah, even though there are gray clouds, we're finding the silver linings. <clears throat> I'd like to also uh, let council know I um, am forming a mayor's back-to-business COVID recovery team. And what we're going to do, we're not going to wait for this to be over. We're going to pr be proactive and we're going to pre-plan. And what we're going to do, uh, and I'm asking council to, to support us through this, uh, the CAO, uh, the fire chief, as well as uh, key uh, members of City Hall from our EOC will be on this. We want it to be a tight committee. Uh, obviously, we're going to have to have IT involved because that's going to be a huge component of the future of what happens in Niagara Falls. And what we're going to do, we're going to define the, the path for the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. It's the new norm. And, and rest assured, I know everyone said after 9-11, oh, it'll never be the same. The world has changed. And they were right. But the last, in the beginning, only 5% of Americans had passports. Everyone was worried. Well, today that number is more like half, more like 50%. And we've had the last five years have been some of the five best years for tourism. So it did bounce back in the new normal, in the new world, post 9-11. Well, the same thing's going to happen post-COVID. We're going to have to come up with lots of strategies of moving forward. We're going to have to pivot. And there's a quote by Plato and it's uh, necessity is the mother of invention, and we will come up with these inventions. Matter of fact, the Niagara Company has developed a sanitizing system using vaporizing hydrogen peroxide and UV light that they were using for fruits and vegetables, which are now using for masks, N95 masks, and these types of technologies. We've got local distilleries who have done a pivot, and they started making hand sanitizer. So we've got a lot of these great uh, creative companies here in Niagara and in Niagara Falls who are going to help take us to the, to the new normal. And the nice thing is there's light at the end of the tunnel. We know it's still a bit of a tunnel, but that's okay. You don't wait until you get there. There's a quote I heard before. It said, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And the idea is you don't wait until you need something. You have it in advance. So we're going to take that proactive approach so we can be ready to jump out of the gates. And Niagara Falls, once again, will rise from the ashes and once again will be the number one leisure destination in Canada. And once again, we'll bring millions of people here, only it'll be done in a different way. So we'll figure that out. And this committee is going to help us define what this is going to look like. So I would ask council to support me and make it official with a, a, a motion uh, sanctioning the creation of this committee. And I would entertain a motion by Councillor Dabrowski, seconded by Councillor Strange. And I'll call the vote, all those in favor. And that's unanimous, and I appreciate that. And uh, I'll keep you abreast of what's going on and apprised of all developments. It's a work in progress, as is this COVID-19. So we don't have all the answers, but we do know what we need to do. <clears throat> and we're going to focus on where we're going. As I say, start with the end in mind and keep your eyes on the prize. And that's what we're going to do here. And that concludes our council notes, I believe. And I would just point out that the next council meeting will be May 12th, and that'll be again at 1 p.m. So we'll welcome everyone to tune in to that next meeting. 
So now we're going to move along to our planning portion of the meeting. Is that right? To so did you want to introduce the next item on the agenda, Mr. Clerk? Uh, yeah, just before I do that, maybe as you had pointed out at the start of the meeting, just a few brief yes. announcements as to what's going on here in the background. And I appreciate uh, you making the announcement to, for those watching to be patient as we try and work out some of these some of these bugs. But what will happen is for those that are watching on WeStream, they'll see a similar screen to what's behind me here. Uh, they'll also see uh, an overview of the council chambers as well. So they'll have a bit of a, a split screen uh, going on uh, to make it easier for people at home. And I need to do this myself. And that's just to slow down a little bit and speak a little bit slower mm -hmm. when, when we are speaking. For those of us in the room, We'll st still be using the microphones at our at our desks. Um, also, Kojiko, with the uh, agreement uh, through WeStream, will be rebroadcasting today's meeting on Thursday at 1 p.m. as well on Kojiko or your TV. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, uh, we will go into the planning portion of today's meeting. Uh, for the purpose of today's meeting, it, it is considered a public meeting. Notice was given. Uh, by our planning department. There were instructions for any members of the public that wanted to participate or had any questions to try and uh, do that through uh, writing into the to council, or sorry, into planning. Um, last I spoke with the planning director, and he can uh, correct me when he comes on, is I don't believe we had anyone that had written in. We also had instructions for anyone who wanted to participate electronically to contact the clerk by noon today. And by email and then we would send them a link to today's meeting. Uh, the only ones that we have on are the applicant and the applicant's representative who are on standby right now with their mics muted and should we get to that portion of the meeting where council would like to hear from the applicant or his, or his representative, um, we would be able to turn their microphone on and hopefully we'll be able to hear them through the chambers. So without any further delu delay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's, I'll, I'll chalk it up to a technical difficulty. <laughs> a public meeting is now being convened to consider a draft plan of subdivision and a plan of common elements condominium at 5820 Robinson Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on April 7th, 2020 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision may contact the city clerk. Yes, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, is this not the uh, development <clears throat> we approved several years ago? Is it uh, the same project or is it the same, uh, the old Coca-Cola plant uh, property? That's right, that's the one. So we did approve this and I think they just had three years and they didn't go ahead with it. So they had to come back, is that true? Well, you know what, we can get that confirmed with the planner. We're gonna call him on right now. Yeah. So now I'll ask our director I of planning. I see, see he's got the falls behind. Is he there? Uh, he's or, here. Or at Buffalo? You know what, I think he's here, I'm not sure. <laughs> he's here today, he is here today. So I'm gonna ask our, even though he's here, but he's in his office, I think. I'm gonna ask our director of planning, Mr. Herlovich, if you could please explain the purpose of the application. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this application is as Councillor Thompson said a resubmission of a plan of subdivision and a uh, common elements condominium. It was approved in 2016. It expired, unfortunately, at the end of three years in 2019, and the owner has had to reapply for this application. The uh, proposal overall is for 34 townhouse dwellings uh, on the former Coca-Cola property. Uh, so that uh, if you can look at your screens, you would see the townhouse development as it would face Main Street in historic Drummondville. The uh, property itself is uh, on the uh, east side of Main Street and south side of Robinson Street. So the driveway into the project would enter from Robinson Street. Uh, there are detached dwellings uh, to the north and east as well as also a parkland uh, to the east on this property. There are uh, dwellings and commercial units on the west side of Main Street. Um, the property itself is 1.7 acres in size. The proposal is to subdivide the land into six blocks. 
five of those blocks would be for townhouse dwellings and a sixth block would be for the road system that would provide access to those units. It will be served by an internal road. Uh, the proposal is for 34 townhouse uh, dwellings altogether. There will be landscape features, parking and the driveway. As I said, it's a plan of subdivision and a common elements condominium. The site was previously zoned, so it's already zoned at, for an R4 zone, which permits the townhouses. And it is a former brownfield site, uh, which has been cleaned up. The uh, subdivision plan itself shows the six blocks uh, in question. So there are five blocks where they will locate the townhouses and the sixth block is the street system, which serves this development. So the overall, this is the plan that you would have. So the um, dwelling units are labeled 34 to 15 along the bottom of the slide. Those are the townhouse dwellings that would face Main Street that we saw earlier. And then the road system uh, towards the top of the slide is the uh, access road providing uh, entrance for the uh, first 14 units, which would uh, be served internal to the site. The uh, application is recommended because it complies with the provincial and regional policies for built up areas and utilizing brownfield sites. It's in conformity with our official plan for the Drummondville node and the bylaw has already been amended to accommodate this form of development. There are conditions of draft plan approval, uh, which will require a record of site condition to be filed with the province to certify the safe uh, use of the land for the proposed residential use. And the conditions also secure landscaping and fencing uh, that will complement the site. And the city and region's interests are to be fulfilled with the conditions that are attached to Appendix A. Therefore, staff is recommending the plan of subdivision subject to the conditions in Appendix A, recommending the common element condominium subject to the conditions in Appendix B. And we're requesting that the mayor or his designate the allowed to sign the draft plan approval uh, within 20 days after the council's decision. And the draft approval will be given for a three-year period and that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the condominium agreement and any required documents at the time of future reg registration. Those are the highlights of this application. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Planner, do we have any questions or comments of city council? Mr. Uh, Councillor Thompson, so you got you, you were right exactly about what you said. Yeah. I, I, I was impressed with this development when I first saw it and uh, wonder why it didn't go ahead. And I have the pleasure to <clears throat> move. Did you close the meeting? Not yet. I'm going to see if there's any questions oh, and then okay. I'll close it. Yeah. So do we have any questions or comments of council on this proposal? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed draft plan of subdivision and draft plan of common elements condominium is now concluded. So moved. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange that we approve the recommendations, five before you. And if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Okay. Now, uh, Councillor, did you uh, find your, uh, did you want to do our declarations? And I'll do the same. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I did. Check 436053, March 5th, 2020, for 37724, payable to myself. Check 435918, February 27th, 2020. $115.34 payable to myself. The next two are project share. I sit on the board as a resident at that time. 435762, February 20th, 2020, for 24866 And check 436760, April 1st, 2020, 24866 And then two for the Niagara Falls Art Gallery, which I sit on as a resident. Check 435737, February 20th, 2020, for 233333 And check Check 436736, April 1st, 2020, for $2,333.33. Thank you. Ah, thank you. You got those ones, uh, Mr. Clerk? <laughs> okay. And uh, as well, uh, pecuniary interest, uh, I've got checks I'd like to declare as well. 436171, 436373, 
435-967-435-663 and 435-892 checks made out to myself as well. So we are moving on to presentations. Item 6.1 for anyone following along in their agenda. 2020 water wastewater budget, City of Niagara Falls. And we have our presentation in uh, your agenda package. And uh, Mr. CAO, I guess we're gonna have, uh, Tiffany's gonna walk us through this through Zoom. So uh, take it away, uh, Ms. Clark. Ed Lustig. Oh, yeah. Okay, right after we do this, we'll do it. Good idea. Did you wanna do that first? Okay, sure, we'll do that. Uh, Mr. CAO, <laughs> would you mind introducing, there's a strange person uh, on the video Zoom with a white shirt. We're just wondering who that is. Well, absolutely, uh, Mr. Mayor, and he used to actually sit Got in the seat in front of us here, too. but many of you know uh, Mr. Ed Lustig. We uh, were fortunate enough to have Ed come and help us out in a time of transition when we are between our full-time solicitor uh, Ed's been with us a couple of weeks and unfortunately he came at a sort of a uh, unfortunate time in terms of how we're delivering service, but Ed has been with us and available to us and through this so far has been providing us excellent advice as we move some through some of the decisions that we've been making. So uh, Ed is joining us for the first meeting here today. So Ed, if you'd like to say hello to everybody. He's muted. Got to unmute though. He doesn't get to talk to this meeting. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you very much. I'm happy to be back uh, to help. Um, unfortunately, the circumstances are what they are, but as the mayor pointed out in his um, earlier comments, uh, we're all in this group, and I'm sure we're going to work it out. Uh, so uh, if I can help, um, I'm here mainly Tuesday and Thursday. That's Those are the two days that I'm going to be here in City Hall, and um, I'm available by... Uh, the city's um, email system and on the phone as well. So thank you, and I look forward to working with you. Well, your timing's perfect, Ed. It's great to have you back here, and you've done pretty much all the jobs here, I think. So it's good to see if you can do a better job the second time around. <laughs> that was a joke. Just joking. <laughs> Cue the laugh. You Cue know, the practice applause. makes perfect. Yeah. Yeah, the jokes, the humor hasn't gotten any better here, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, um, now uh, Tiffany Clark, our Director of Finance, our treasurer will take us through our water and wastewater budget. So, Tiffany, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. <laughs> okay, so we're going to look at our uh, 2020 water wastewater budget. Um, we just hadn't had a chance to do it uh, before COVID happened, and now it's here. Um, so we're going to look at um, the breakdown here. So it's a two-tiered service, um, the region and the city, obviously. Um, we're going to go through our asset management plan targets, uh, as well as some of our rebate programs, and then our 2020 um, rates. So, sorry, Just getting used to this. So the region's a service provider to the city of Niagara Falls. They're responsible for the water wastewater treatment facilities and the pumping stations, um, as well as the sewers that are within our boundaries. Um, the region is 75% variable for water, 25% fixed. Um, and then for sewer, it's 100% fixed. And they also contribute to some of our CSO programs. So we did recently get an email that they are putting their CSO program on hold for right now, um, but they'll get back to us in a few weeks when they have a chance to evaluate that. Uh, so City of Niagara Falls uh, is the management authority responsible for water and sewer systems. Our staff um, do this in two parts. So operations is done by municipal works and billing of course is done by finance. Uh, we provide the maintenance and replacement of the water distributions uh, system and wa wastewater system, as well as charge the residents and provide customer service to the ratepayers. So if we look at um, the water budget uh, overall, the 
water budget's going up slightly from last year, $400,000 there. The breakdown between the region and the city cost is still the same at 54% um, of the expenses in the water budget are directly um, owed to the region. So we have no control over those expenses. And 46% of the budget is, is within our control. Those are the city's expenses. So moving on to look at them in a little bit more detail, we've got the um, regional charges up there at the 1.89% uh, here. Uh, that's how much they've gone up. Sorry, that's a dollar sign, but that should be a percentage. <laughs> um, the fixed charges are going up 2.6%. We've kept the transfer to capital the same uh, at the $5 million, and this is to mitigate um, some of the region's increases that they've um, sent through with, with their billing as well as knowing that this isn't the year maybe to increase these with, with um, the COVID situation going on right now and people just being in a crunch for, for finances. Uh, in terms of the city's operating charges that are left, um, they're going up slightly at 3.6% uh, and the, rev the non-rate revenue is just going down slightly. So this would be uh, user fees, flat rate fees, penalties. Um, the reason obviously for the rate revenue going down would be I've adjusted the penalty revenue budget. Uh, I've reduced it by 25% since we have agreed to waive fees for three months. Um, that would be penalty revenue we would no longer collect. And that was about um, $10,000 a month between the two budgets, water and sewer. So some key points in the um, water expenditures, uh, I've already covered this, the regional costs are the 75% volumetric. We are requesting um, a new staff member. So uh, converting, we had one six month casual seasonal laborer and we're requesting one full-time laborer. So it's an additional six months. Um, and that's to perform trench maintenance, which is uh, part of our maintenance standards. The capital spend, spending of $5 million, I've gone over, we have not increased that this year in the water side. Uh, it's still lower than our asset management plan requirements of six, almost $6.1 million. So it is a, a moving target. We will have to address that in the future years. Um, and then this year, um, and this is where we'd be looking for a little bit of council input perhaps, we're recommending putting the following rebate programs on hold. So the toilet, uh, retrofit program, the rain barrel program, and the flowy rebate. Um, just given, again, the COVID situation, we wanted to try to eliminate expenses where we could. And some of these programs um, could certainly use um, another look at them to see if they're even well used and, and something we want to move on with in the future. So we have pr proposed putting those three programs on hold for the time being. Um, so the rebate programs that are included in our budget is the senior water rebate account. So again, that's a hundred dollar water credit that's available to seniors over 65 on the GIS, um, receiving the GIS supplement and that have a water um, account with the city. It's well used. Uh, in 2019, we approved 722 applications. So I've increased the budget from 68,000 to 75,000, which I imagine that's just a reflection of the demographics changing. Um, so we, we have room now to approve 750 applications for the senior water rebate account. The high water consumption adjustment. Um, we This is where if you have um, a leak in your house and you're looking for a rebate, let's say you get a one-time rebate of 55%, or sorry, 50% of the volumetric charge. Um, hopefully I'm not speaking too fast. I'm not listening well to Bill's instructions. <laughs> um, you get the, a 50% rebate on the volumetric charge. Uh, last year we gave back uh, $26,000 for high water rebate consumption. So we do still have that policy in place. And then uh, the last one is the sod watering rebate. So there's a budget of $2,000 uh, that's included in 2020, and that covers 200 applications. So um, when we damage your sod, or our sod, I suppose, on our boulevard, we will plant new sod, and um, we offer a rebate of $10 on some on individuals' water accounts as we encourage them to water it so, that, so the sod will grow. Um, so moving on to the wastewater side of things, um, the wastewater side's actually gone down about 500,000. So you can see between the two budgets, they've, they've balanced themselves out. Um, and this is largely due, you can see the decreases in the regional costs. So the regional costs have gone down about a million dollars on the sewer side. 
um, this fluctuates year by year. They bill us based on an average consumption over um, a certain time period. And this billing from the region fluctuates quite a bit. Uh, so it worked out well for us this year. It doesn't mean next year it's going to go down again. I would expect it to. Uh, so in this case, it's actually shifted. You can see in 2019, it used to be 62% of the sewer budget was the region's costs and 38% city. With the decrease in the regional costs in the sewer, um, it's now 59% regional and 41% is the city costs. And then just breaking that out in slightly more detail, you can actually see that it's gone down by 1.2 million here. We did, um, with the favorable reduction, in, in the regional costs, we did, did bump up the transfer to capital to five million, which is in line with our BMA long range uh, financial plan, which was the five year plan that, that we did. Um, I believe it was uh, 2017. So, um, and just to note on the water side, we should have been increasing that transfer by 200,000 as well. It should have been a 5.2, but in the interest of uh, trying to keep the rates the same this year for the rate payers um, to provide a little bit of stability in these uncertain times, we didn't go ahead with that increase. So just moving on to the net city operating charges, those have, um, as much as those look like they've gone up 11%, there's also uh, corresponding transfers from reserves bringing money in down here on the non-rate revenue that's gone up 15%. So uh, they do bounce themselves out. So moving right along, um, just some key points on the wastewater. So 100% fixed cost from the region and same request for staff. So there's also in the wastewater budget, we'd like to remove one six month casual seasonal laborer and replace with a one year full time. So again, just an additional six months of costs and that's to perform um, trench maintenance, which is, is again, part of our minimum maintenance standards. We have to do. There is debt servicing in the sewer budget of $874,000. Um, this relates to a, a debenture from many, many years ago. And we've been paying that those debenture costs with development charges. So that's completely offset by DC reserves. There's no impact to the ratepayer on that. And then just pointing out again that the capital spending of $5 million that we've now increased it to is, is still well below what we're supposed to have for our asset management plan. We should be around the $6.5 million mark. So it's a moving target. We're working on getting there. And then there is uh, one rebate program in the 2020 wastewater budget, and that is the RAP program, Weeping Tile Removal Assistance. Um, we've got a budget of $500,000 in there, as well as uh, some reserves from unspent money in previous years that we um, use up when RAP applications are approved. Now for the rate structure. So um, we have a 60-40 split in, in water with um, 60% variable and 40% fixed, and sewer is 62% variable, 38% fixed cost right now. And that's in line with the advice um, in our rate study of moving towards a 60-40 split. So our proposed rates, uh, I have done my best to keep them as close to the same as possible as I could to last year. So the water volumetric is going from 2.318 dollars per cubic meter to 2.332 dollars per cubic meter so it's going up by 1.4 pennies per cubic meter that is as close as i could get to the same <laughs> the fixed costs are going down um, just minimally so uh annual costs going down from 497 dollars annually on um, a residential meter down to 487 dollars so savings of nine well ten dollars for uh, as you can see in this slide, number of active accounts by meter size, the um, 5H three quarters meters, which would be your residential and smaller commercial, like a convenience store, say, that makes up 97% of our system. So most of our meters, um, most of our rate payers paying bills on a 5H three quarters meter. So we do focus a little bit more on scenarios on those meters. Um, and we'll go through one right now. So we'll go through low a uh, low user, uh, average user, and a high user, and, and we've used uh, 88 meters, uh, 88 cubic meters for a low user, and we're just showing the breakdown of 2019 versus 2020, what that would have cost you. You can see there's an uh, annual change, a reduction of about $8.37. Um, again, I was trying to 
keep it the same as last year. And the average user using, oh dear. <laughs> the average user using 184 cubic meters, uh, going down about $7 for the year. And the high user using 282 <clears throat> cubic meters, going down on about five and a half dollars for the year. And then just uh, on the other meter sizes, so as well as the 5H three quarters, just a breakdown of the monthly fixed charges and the change per month. So you can see the 5H three quarters just going down 80 cents a month. Uh, the other one's just going up minimally with the largest one being um, $36 a month increase on the $4,400 inch meter. And then just a quick little update on our dashboard. Um, last year, I think we were at uh, 3,700 accounts signed up and now we're at 4,800. And as you can imagine, with um, no longer being able to come in uh, to the building as the public, we're actually getting a lot of uptake on our dashboard. So I expect these numbers to go up even higher over the next few months. So that's a good news sign. Um, people can register on the dashboard. You can look up your property taxes. Uh, you can look up your water billing, you can see your payment history. So lots of neat things on there. Uh, definitely something to look for. Anybody wants to sign up, we've included the link here um, or feel free to uh, peruse our website. You'll find that information there. And then just, just lastly, our recommendations. So that council approved the 2020 water wastewater budget as presented um, and that we approve converting one six month casual seasonal laborer to a full-time laborer in the water budget as well as the same situation in the wastewater budget. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lococo. I think Councillor oh. I was motion, oh, to, okay. All right. Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to Ms. Clark, I had a question. We we're looking at the budgets in general for bringing on any new positions. What would the budget look like if we didn't approve those two six month to full time? And what would that do to the work that you need to get done? Uh, through the mayor, um, I think it uh, it would make minimal change. Um, the impact was an additional, I think, fifty thousand dollars, like twenty five thousand each. Um, it would be very minimal when you consider that the that amount is spread over the thirty thousand uh, ratepayer accounts. It w it would be a minimal change, and then I think the offside of that is. These, these positions were designed to help meet our, our standards, um, our minimum maintenance standards. Eric, if you want to, Mr. Nickel, if you want to jump in and add anything, feel free. I, I think they're worth having in place. We, um, we were able to get a lot of work done with certain positions that we had, and um, I think that we need them. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Eric Nickel here. Uh, it, just to echo what Tiffany is saying, um, as we add more water main to our system and as our system starts to age, those types of positions where our, we're maintaining infrastructure and we're providing dedicated resources become very valuable. So we flagged it as a, as a potential to take an existing position and expand on it um, and uh, provide some stability throughout those uh, off-season months. Uh, to continue to do some more trench maintenance and improve the road conditions around the city. So that's why we're suggesting it, and we do believe it is warranted. And I can elaborate a bit further. I found the justification memo. <laughs> it's uh, two laborers uh, to maintain unrestored trenches exclusively, which then allows the licensed staff to perform operator functions such as valve turning and hydrant flushing. So it's just to help with um, moving our programs along. Does that answer your question, Councillor? Yes, it does. Thank you. And I would like to second the motion then. Okay, great. And just a reminder to all the council, please really speak into the mics. The Zoom uh, technical people just te messaged me. They're struggling a little bit to hear. you got to really direct your voice right into the mic and make sure it's turned on. Um, any other comments or questions of council? Okay. Seeing none, we've got a motion by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Lococo, that we move the recommendations in the water wastewater budget. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you, Ms. Clark. Good job. <laughs> Pardon me? <laughs> uh, okay. Moving on to item 6.2, COVID-19 pandemic service level update and operations. 
And we're going to ask Eric Nickler, Director of Municipal Works, along with Kathy Moldenhauer, our Director of Rec and Culture, to help do a presentation and update council and the residents. So you guys can take it away. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and pardon the delay while I try to get uh, myself organized here. Can we all see the presentation? Yes, we do. Perfect. Uh, so um, during the course of our EOC discussions and as we discover what changes are necessary to keep up with the uh, uh, community needs and the requirements to keep, um, keep our workers safe and keep programs available for the community, uh, we felt it was important to come back with an update to council on uh, a number of uh, programming changes as well as some of the uh, maintenance items that we're tracking for the upcoming season. So this presentation will be a joint presentation uh, between uh, the Director of Recreation and Culture and myself. And uh, I would encourage that uh, if there are any questions from council during the course of the presentation, um, we can certainly uh, um, address those during the presentation because we have a number of items to cover. So if, if it is okay with you, uh, Your Worship, I'd like to let you uh, um, scan the room and, and interject when necessary. I, I can't see people from my desk right now. I will scan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I am hoping we're showing the second slide. Is that correct? No. No. You have to start the presentation. I have to have it on the wrong screen. That clears it up. That's better? No, no, we just see a flower. Uh, no? A pretty <laughs> flower. Oh, boy. Okay. Is that your dog, Eric? What is that picture? Well, I wanted a picture of your dog, Mr. Mayor, but uh, I'm not sure where he is Good today. recovery. That um, was quick. <laughs> pardon me. I'm just going to have to sort out some of these technical difficulties here because I'm looking at several different screens. So, Kathy, you have to tell a joke if uh, Eric can't get his presentation going. So, uh... <laughs> Okay. I'll start thinking. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> or you can sing. It's up to you. Uh, no, you don't want to hear me sing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eric, uh, this one more time. Councillor Strange wants to make sure you've got your, your pants on. Uh. <laughs> 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 okay. Are we still seeing the first screen? Yep. There you No, no. Second screen. No, we're around second. Second screen's okay. up. Okay. Um, again, sorry for the current technical difficulties here. Um, so we'd like to talk about the timing, uh, our current closures, again, programming adjustments, what that means to maintenance. And um, we also have a slide for our uh, treasurer to talk about, about some preliminary financial uh, projections. Um, so I'm just want to make sure you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing right now. So we're seeing the hockey net service level update with the okay. hockey net. Okay. Um, I'll have to do it. Oh, there you go. So in turn, there you go. Okay. Now we've got the Good. calendar. Thank you. And I'm, I apologize. I think I've got the hang of it now. Uh, <laughs> so timing, um, the, uh, as we've been going through the day to day, uh, emergency operations discussions, it's become very clear, um, that uh, the, the forecast for the pandemic planning is uh, you know, the month of April, we can guarantee that our, our facilities are going to be closed, our recreational opportunities are going to be closed. Um, and the city has already um, decided that it, for the month of May, our facilities are closed. Um, but what we're really tr uh, struggling with, and, and it's a challenge, is to find out and to determine what is the schedule look like for uh, the time beyond May. So we are having those discussions about June and beyond. Uh, just at this time, we're taking it day to day and we don't know uh, for any certainty if we will be required to keep uh, facilities closed or if they can be reopened. Uh, but we can certainly report back to council on the, um, uh, those decisions 
and council will be part of the decision making uh, more than likely as we have to make some difficult decisions if the situation extends well past June. Um, so the, um, the current closure uh, includes all of our recreational facilities, all of our outdoor recreation amenities and outdoor areas of congregation, uh, all of our playgrounds, um, Oaks Park and our dog, uh, our dog parks, and even things in the provincial order are included, such as uh, frisbee golf facilities. So all of those are closed right now and remain closed by provincial order. Um, however, there are some um, areas that will remain open, and that includes our open spaces. <coughs> our trails remain open for passive use uh, and continued use, uh, provided <coughs> that people practice physical distancing. Our parks remain open for walkthrough access, but those recreational facilities are still closed by provincial order. Um, and the markets is, uh, is a provincially uh, recognized um, essential service and it is uh, can be slated to be opened. Um, and uh, Ms. Moldenhauer may talk about that a little bit later. Uh, so we'll move on to some of the programming adjustments and uh, the Director of Recreation and Culture will take over the discussions for a few slides here. Okay, thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. The uh, first slide here is to show you what events that have been canceled for the month of May and what future events in June and July may be canceled. So as you can see from this slide, there was a number of tournaments and special events, including the Women's Place Book Riot that have been canceled at the arena at the Gale Center. Athletic fields, again, a number of tournaments, soccer tournaments, baseball, outdoor events that have been canceled include uh, many Park New City events, all of the, the MIAC events, the Recreation Committee City Garage Sale. Some of the events that may be canceled, depending upon what does happen at the arena at the Gale Center for the month of June and July, we have a number of tournaments booked. And again, in athletic fields, we have soccer tournaments, baseball, outdoor events. We've got the Chippewa Lions Carnival, Volkswagen Car Show, the Volunteer <clears throat> Firefighters Carnival, Junus Recreation Month. And I would like to talk about Canada Day and please share any questions or comments. Canada Day is one of the largest events that the city does run. We have our parade and then we have a full day of activities. Staff have been contacting municipalities in Cross Ontario and a number of them, including Ottawa, have made the decision to cancel their traditional Canada Day event. Some of them are looking to see what they can do, if they can do like a virtual Canada Day and have different events that people can watch, such as different concerts, cooking shows, you can do whatever you want. We could do a website online campaign. We are meeting online with other local municipalities. Perhaps we could organize that all communities in the Niagara region sing O Canada at 12 noon. We could encourage people to decorate their homes. So there are many ways we can still celebrate Canada, but we are considering canceling the parade and the event. And I would love to know if council has any comments regarding canceled uh, regarding canceling Canada Day before we move on to the next slide. Well, why don't we uh, look around the room and see uh, Councillor Cario. Well, thank you, Worship. If the other municipalities, many of the other municipalities yeah, are, yeah. many of the other municipalities are canceling their festivities and Correct. we are thinking we might. I just yes. thought if we do it sooner than later, it would give people a chance or time to maybe plan something else. If we wait right till the last minute, it might be a, a little bit more inconvenient. That'd be my only, yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Any other uh, feedback from council? I, I think, I think uh, Kathy, looking around the room, I think, I think we all feel the same way. We know how much planning goes into that event. Yes. And uh, you aren't going to know until the last minute, and it's not going to turn out well. So I think this council would be supportive if uh, it's probably not a bad idea that this year we're not going to have a Canada Day parade. Okay. Thank you very much for, for the comments. And 
we'll start planning our uh, virtual Canada Day. All right, our next big decision <laughs> is regarding our, our summer outdoor swimming pools. And as people are aware, we do have five outdoor pools that we typically open late June. The maintenance for the pools is performed by the arena's operations staff. And we do hire students throughout the summer to be our lifeguards and our instructors. At this point in time, we're not too sure what we will be doing with the pools. And at the chart at the bottom of the slide, we have showed that if we make the decision now to open all of our pools in July, we will need four staff in the month of May and June to get the buildings and the pools ready. If we make the decision in June, due to our labor force, it's difficult to open all of the pools, but we would recommend opening up two of the pools. And the two pools that we do recommend opening are FH Leslie, that's our largest pool, and it also has our highest attendance and the second highest attendance would be Prince Charles Pool. If things change and we don't find out until July if we can open our pools, then we recommend that all of our pools close. So as I have written on this slide, it does take two weeks to prepare per pool, to, to open up a pool. And obviously we would need time to, to hire our, our lifeguards and instructors. Another item that we are deciding about is whether we offer swim lessons or swim team this year. And when we have spoken to other municipalities at this time, people have not made a decision about opening swimming pools or whether or not they will be running swim lessons. Again, with this slide, I would appreciate any comments or questions from council. Okay, uh, councillors, so you hear what they're asking. Um, the question is, yeah, uh, go ahead, Councillor Cario. A question, uh, Your Worship. Uh, you've been involved in, in more meetings, obviously, than any of us with all the other emergency people. Uh, I just see what, uh, in a lot of times, what I see on television with the uh, Premier and uh, our uh, Prime Minister. So they're suggesting that when things open up, uh, things are gonna open up with conditions. So you might know better uh, what they're thinking or maybe they've shared things with you, but my guess would be that anything that we can't uh, comply with social distancing and things like that are the things they're not gonna allow us to have. They might allow us to have things or do things where we could uh, do them uh, and still have our, keep our distance and other things, but uh, Mr. Tudor is saying that prior to a vaccine, uh, life is gonna be similar to this for a long time, which would lead me to think that there's no chance in the world we'd be open in pools in May. And then, uh, I don't know, like I said, you, you've had more exposure to these meetings than the rest of us. You might be able to add more. Well, Ms. Moldenhauer, were you, you don't suggest we open the pools in May. You're saying that's when you begin the preparation, correct. right? Correct, correct. The, the maintenance staff would start working on the pools in May and the goal would be to have them open late June, early July. Late June, and yeah. one, one item we have talked about is reducing the um, capacity oh, yeah. for, for each pool to try to reduce our numbers. And again, to, to keep you know, our social distancing, that is one of the reasons why we're considering canceling swim lessons. We're not too sure how many people would want to participate in the lessons. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Moldenhauer. If we go with the two pools, do you see the the attendance being a lot more and then having mm -hmm. to um, limit the capacity as well? Because if we only have two pools in the whole city, will people come from another part of the city to come to that, that pool? Yes. Thank you. We, we, we would definitely have to limit our capacity. So we, it, it, it's hard. We do have splash pads that are located at each pool site as well. And the next slide, we will be talking about the splash pads. So we do plan on opening them 
but there would probably be a higher number if we only had two pools. It's a good, good point, because when the grocery stores reduced their hours and days of operation, you had more people concentrated in a mm -hmm. shorter period of time. So you actually raised the amount of opportunity for people to interact. That's the downside. Correct. That's the downside of that. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, is there any chance that we could put this decision off until yeah. May 12th? Yeah. Um, simply because, I mean, the, in the province, we're still in a state of emergency. Exactly. So uh, let's wait and see what the province does in a couple of weeks, and then, and then maybe we can revisit this again. Yeah. I, I think we're getting consensus here, uh, Kathy, that uh, it's too soon to tell. It's only April. Uh, this is going to directly come from the province. And, you know, we, it's, it's so far out to make a decision at this point that maybe we're going to have to leave it for a little bit longer. I know it doesn't help you with your planning, but at least you don't have to worry about Canada Day. We got that one checked off. <laughs> Thank you. And, and we do appreciate the comments. We just wanted to make you aware of some of the decisions that, that we're dealing with at this time. Great. Oh, hold on one sec, Kathy. Okay. So then, uh, well then, why don't we do the same on the splash pads, Kathy? Because again, if we're going to okay. open up, if we're going to open up parks, you'd think you'd open up splash pads. But let's wait and see what the province says about parks as well, right? So, so, so soon for us to, since we get our marching orders from the province, probably best that we get them. So we're going to move past splash pads and swimming pools, and you can move on to your sports fields. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back to Eric for the uh, sports fields. Thank you. So uh, for the purpose of planning during this pandemic situation, um, we've approached the two, uh, we've approached sports fields in two different tiers. Um, so we're going to talk first about our uh, tier one, which is our premier sports fields. That would include uh, Oaks Park, Patrick Cummings Memorial Sports Complex, K Taylor, E.E. E. Mitchelson, Kerr Park, and C.W. Palmer. So a total of 21 soccer pitches and 16 diamonds. Now, on a typical season, soccer is starting uh, by uh, Victoria Day or after Victoria Day. So this year, that's May 19th. But baseball would start uh, in a few weeks as of May 1st. Um, so, you know, anticipating that... Um, these fields will not re receive any play until further notice. Um, but when uh, those teams want to come back and use them or there's bookings to come back and use them, we know that we have to perform some maintenance on them. We can't allow them to turn into hay fields uh, because the actual effort to um, maintain them after that will be uh, in incredible. So um, it's our recommendation to dewinterize those fields, which means uh, do some of the, the the uh, lawn maintenance, aerating, fertilizing, uh, any of the sprinkler systems to blow them out, and to cut those fields as typical. Um, we may not require, we won't require, um, you know, regular maintenance on them because they'll be closed for use. But we are recommending to keep those fields in tip-top shape so that they're ready to be um, played on when we have orders lifted from the province. So. In, uh, in cooperation with the user groups, uh, we are really collaboratively trying to come together to determine what that looks like for sports teams and their types of seasons. So if the, if the uh, emergency orders are lifted by the end of May, it's likely that those seasons will need some time to get registrations and the season will be, will be delayed until later in, in June. Um, and similarly, if the orders are lifted by the end of June, it's going to take a, a little bit of time to get a season. But there is a drop dead date for those fields when um, the user groups who haven't made any firm decisions yet, but I'm sure they would be considerate that um, if there's a pandemic that extends with restrictions on use of fields until the end of July, there's a likelihood that they may not continue with the season or it may be a very um, different season. So we would expect that their seasons may be canceled as uh, uh, pandemic lifted at the end of July means a uh, very short August and September season for especially for school age children. So one of the notes that we wanted to highlight is that um, we do require a full week of full staff to get these fields back up and operational. 
So we'll maintain them. The plan at this point is to maintain them so they're ready to go, but we need those staff in there to do the game day ready activities. So striping the field, putting up the nets and making sure that they're safe and ready to go uh, when the user groups are ready to use them. So in conjunction with our tier one facilities. Uh, hey Eric, can you considered... just hold on one second, Eric? Um, Councillor, can you, yeah, Councillor Peter Angelo has a question for you and has this Councillor Lococo. Yeah, not a, <clears throat> Excuse me, not a question, Your Worship. I was just going to say that, I mean, we might receive some criticism because people might, uh, you know, not understand why the city is uh, still maintaining fields and ball diamonds when people aren't using them. But I think what they have to understand is that it would cost us more money to get them back into the shape that they're already in uh, if we don't maintain them mm -hmm. and we just kind of let them go. So um, I, I think it's imperative that, uh, you know, ball diamonds and, uh, and soccer pitches um, and those kind of uses absolutely be maintained. So, I mean, if, mis if Mr. Nickel is looking for support, I, I, w I would say that the council would support the position that, uh, that those type of uses have to be maintained, Your Worship. Okay, so uh, did you hear that, Eric? I don't know, oh, I'm sorry, we got Councilor Lococo and then uh, if you need a motion, uh, let us know. Uh, Councilor Lococo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering for the Canada Summer 21 Games, will any of these parks be affected because of the work that we need to do for that to get them ready? Yeah. Eric? Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll start with a, a quick comment on Councillor Peter Angelo's comment. Um, we do expect that, and he's absolutely correct, to let the fields go will require an investment much greater than the cost to maintain those fields. So, so um, I appreciate that. That is our plan, and, and uh, I don't believe we'll need a motion to move that forward. Okay. With respect to the summer games projects, uh, at this point we're, um, we're hosting at Oaks Park. That is the primary facility, and uh, we have some improvements happening at Oaks Park. We believe that we can accommodate the improvements um, for the games next year, provided that um, you know, by, by the summer this pandemic is lifted and that we can access the Oaks Park field for improvements, uh, which are scheduled after Labor Day. So we'll work in concert with the user groups to make sure they're aware of any restrictions at that park, but we expect we can accommodate without any concern. Okay, so that looks like all the questions at this point. Okay, thank you. So and in consideration of, of the, um, what we can call their tier two and three sports fields, um, those are fields which we may not maintain um, at the same standards uh, during regular uh, regular seasons. That includes two soccer pitches, 13 diamonds, and one cricket pitch. So in a similar logic to our Tier 1 sports fields, can't afford to let those facilities turn into um, to hay fields. There's issues with, certainly with ticks and uh, with, with safety. Uh, and the cost to bring those fields back to usable conditions. Um, we're recommending that we, we uh, perform basic maintenance, so that's regular mowing and trimming at all of those locations, and uh, to do a bit higher standard of maintenance at the um, cricket pitch at John Allen and the senior diamonds at Chippewa Lions, because we know we have bookings, regular bookings at those facilities for tournaments. Um, so standard maintenance and basic maintenance are, are more or less the same, um, with just a little extra attention to detail at those stand at those um, two facilities, the Cricket Pitch and the Chippewa Lions Park. Um, so just to, re to, to provide some reassurance, the plan will be to maintain them and to keep them um, ready to go, but it will still require, just like our Tier 1 sports fields, some time to get those fields, about a week to get them lined and ready to go for, for regular use. Uh, the good news is when we look at our sports fields, um, without users on the fields, especially um, senior diamond users, um, we know that the regular wear and tear that we're faced with throughout the year will be limited. And uh, in fact, by the uh, summer season, if they're open later in the summer season, um, I have a feeling these will be um, these fields will be looking in great shape because we have had uh, limited uh, foot traffic and disruption on the turf. So I'm confident if we continue to maintain them we'll be able to have them back in operation as quick as possible. Worship, does he need a motion to support that course of action? Do you, um, 
you feel, yes, Mr. CAO? Mr. Mayor, I think as we move through, perhaps it would be appropriate if we had uh, the council motion mm -hmm. on tier one, two, and three sports fields before we move through sure. the recommendations that were outlined in the report. That's fine, Your Worship. Okay, motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we support the staff recommendations for the sports fields. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, so you're good to continue on, Mr. Nickel. And this uh, this slide will be taken over by uh, Ms. Mullenhauer. Okay, thank you, Eric. The um, McBain Community Center, of course, has been closed since mid-March. With the facility being closed, obviously all of the, the rentals have been canceled. The library and the YMCA, their programs are also canceled. The plan would be when the emergency order ends, then of course we'll open up the, the facility for normal business. At present time, we do have city staff that, that are working in the office on a rotating schedule when some people are not in the office and of course they're working from home and that includes finance staff, recreation staff and parking staff, city staff and the YMCA staff are maintaining the center to just ensure that everything's in proper working order. The arenas, we had removed Chippewa Arena Ice the week that we did close all of our facilities. So the arena there has almost been shut down for a month. Ice has also been removed from rink number one and rink number two. And this is recommended maintenance that of course we've just moved up to now rather than later in the summer. It's also worked out very well because we can accommodate some of the municipal work staff that are now working at the Gale Center. We've got lots of space for everybody to work there. What has been canceled, of course, are tournaments, camps and leagues at this point in time until the end of May. And we're just waiting to see if we can get back to normal business in June. April tryouts were canceled. They'll be rescheduled for later on. And all of the arena operations staff have been transferred to municipal works. So none of the operations staff are currently working at the arena. We have redeployed some of our administration union staff and they're helping to keep the facility clean. So based on this, from March 14th to June 1st, the approximate lost for revenue will be 340,000. We hope again that we can become open at the end of June and we can host our four tournaments and some of our, our special events. With the Niagara Falls History Museum, we have also been closed there since um, mid-March. What that meant, of course, is we had no March break programming. Some of the elementary school programming that was scheduled to take place this spring has been canceled. Thursday night programs canceled. Obviously, there's no ongoing visitation to our gallery. The staff, if you do follow the Niagara Falls History Museum online, they have been doing some virtual programming as a replacement to our normal programming. With our staff at the museum, we have actually transferred two of the museum staff to Municipal Works to help with some of the outdoor maintenance. So what we did have to cancel was um, in June, we had planned some Indigenous month and that involved programming that has been canceled, which we, we hope to offer some of our programming at a later date. Coronation 50 plus recreation center is closed. And with this closure, obviously again, all of our events and activities have been canceled. But what we are doing is um, with our members, staff have been doing phone check-ins and emails just to ensure that everybody's doing fine. We also had a program called Members Helping Members. So some of the, the younger members we're going to the store, for example, to pick up milk or bread for the older members that couldn't get out. 
We have um, a great selection of virtual programming going on. We've got book club, we've got bingo, we've got trivia, and we even have Zumba. So staff are working really hard to keep our members that are at home entertained throughout this difficult time. Are there any questions about recreation facilities from Council? Do we have any questions from Ms. Moldenhauer about our facilities? No, it looks like everybody's good so far with everything you've uh, reported. Okay, perfect, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Eric. Thank you, and if uh, I'll ask for Council's patience, we're going to try to go full screen here and I have some expert help, so um, Bear with us, we're gonna to try to get this thing full screen again. Because uh, I realize for those following along at home, it may be challenging. So. Okay, are we back? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you and I apologize again. We'll, we'll get through these books. Um, so while we talk about um, the programming changes, we also wanted to um, give some consideration to the, the annual maintenance and what that means for our resources. Um, So within uh, the Municipal Works Group, we rely very heavily on our seasonal, casual, and student positions um, to perform the seasonal maintenance. And that includes right now a, a vacancy of about 30 people. So that's um, staff um, vacancies due to retirements or, or taking other postings. And we have 69 recall positions between seasonal and casuals and students. Um, through conversations with our, our unions and, and human resources, um, our, our efforts have been focused around keeping our full-time staff engaged and redeployed. And as Ms. Moldenhauer mentioned, that includes redeploying arena staff and museum staff. Um, those are the groups that have specifically been transferred over to Municipal Works to help conduct some of the um, annual maintenance programs that we have going on. Uh, but we're at a point now with spring of uh, right around the corner, despite the snow we had outside today, we do need to be making some decisions on how we want to move forward with those staffing vacancies. And we have two options um, or, or combinations of options to either reduce service levels. And sometimes that's appropriate now, especially with um, provincial, provincially mandated um, restrictions or simply to maintain some um, es essential and non-essential distinctions but it also may be appropriate right now to be recalling seasonal staff because maintenance is required. Um, so we'll go through some of those specific areas that are listed on this slide. Uh, so to start with cemeteries, we have within the city boundary and we maintain seven active and uh, or semi-active uh, cemeteries and we have 14 inactive locations. So we typically call those our pioneer cemeteries. And um, to maintain those cemeteries, we rely on a seasonal increase of seven seasonal staff for full-time of 35 weeks and seven students for 18 weeks, plus a contractor. And the contractor would be um, mowing those uh, uh, pioneer cemeteries more regularly. So these are the maintenance staff in addition to our core burial staff 
who are with us on a year-round basis. So as was maybe mentioned earlier, at, at this point, we have already reassigned eight full-time staff and we have pressed pause on the maintenance of the Pioneer Cemeteries through a contract. Um, in doing so, we are at a deficit staff-wise, but we realize there's cost containment measures and there's also some expectations that need to be addressed in terms of ongoing maintenance at these facilities. Um, we believe that it would be appropriate at this point in time to, to reduce service levels by discontinuing monument restoration. So in years past, we've partnered with the Willowbank School of Restoration, had some of their students and our staff uh, do monument restoration, and that's been very successful and even award-winning. Um, but in this current situation, if we are to keep to core staff, we may need to discontinue that for the coming year. And we'd also just uh, consider um, keeping things to a minimum by doing basic maintenance and reducing our cut frequency uh, to a reasonable level. We don't know what that is right now because it's very weather dependent, um, but those are the achievable um, conditions we can we can reach if we continue without calling back additional seasonal students. Um, the current complements that we have of the eight reassigned staff is significantly less than the additional 14 that we have plus a contractor. So it is our recommendation to bring back a few seasonal and students as required, which may mean some changes in the, um, the suitable workers at the cemetery. We don't have specific numbers on what that looks like right now, um, but if we can, we can have a decision to discontinue monument restoration and try to address the basics, we feel we can address um, the, the essential mowing and maintenance needs of the cemeteries without calling a contractor in and by supplementing with only a handful of additional seasonal and students. Um, and if we are in a position where we can lift some of these uh, physical social distancing measures, then we can start to uh, go back to full speed. But these are the, um, this is our recommendation for the cemetery for at least the next uh, few months. Hey, Eric, just before you move on, I've got Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, just looking through the slides that we have here, I'm just wondering if it would be possible to have more of a general discussion of, you know, perhaps the goals of Council. I think we're being asked right now to uh, uh, almost um, micromanage every little, um, every little item, every little department, but I mean, we really don't have the depth of knowledge uh, to know, you know, which workers have been moved over to, uh, you know, perhaps a different department or whatnot. So maybe just a general discussion about what council's goals would, would serve as better guidance, I think, to staff. Um, I mean, I know in a lot of households, um, you know, this time right now has given them an opportunity to do things that they never got around to doing before. Yeah. So perhaps that can be a guidance to staff. I mean, obviously we don't want to um, have people uh, or I, I, I guess pay people to do nothing. So, I mean, if we have projects that, uh, that staff feel are important, um, then absolutely, uh, you know, we need to call back seasonals, we need to call back part-time, we need to call in uh, students, you know, to get the work done. Um, other than that, I don't know that it's gonna serve us much value to go through every single one of these little um, slides and have council make a, you know, have council make it one of them. I don't know what the feeling of the rest of the council is, um, but, you know, perhaps people can tell me if they're feeling the same. I would second that motion. Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, so I've got, uh, you heard the comment, Eric, so Councillor Cario is going to weigh in now as well. Well, the other thing is, Your Worship, um, we've had this for a while, and I think staff should assume that we should have all read all of the reports. So unless we're doing this for the benefit of the people at home, um, you have to assume that we've read all the reports, right? right? Okay. So I guess um, what we're saying, Eric, is uh, Council's going to go by your recommendations. If you need specific policy direction, like we did, you were asked to do on sport fields and on facilities, but if you're looking for the level of maintenance that you need to maintain what we have, then we're going to go by your better judgment. And keep us informed. Yep. We go through. And then the CAO is going to jump in. You can tell he likes to jump up. I can tell when he wants to talk. He's going to say something too. No, we really appreciate the support of council for us to, to make it. We wanted to be here to give you a flavor for what 
a lot of these decision points are. I think the one in particular that uh, we might want to get some further direction on, I believe, would be the beautification program. Uh, this is a bit of a tough call uh, because um, there is a fairly hefty uh, beautification contract, <coughs> a little over $200,000. Part of our belief is that we should be continuing on, on with some of our beautification efforts uh, that would be in our main sort of uh, downtown tourist BIA areas, uh, some of our key areas around the city because as we come out of uh, the pandemic, uh, I think our expectation is that our citizens are gonna wanna have our city uh, looking well maintained and, and looking beautiful. There may be some of that that we can come back on. Uh, you know, and we're certainly willing to make the decisions. I know Mr. Uh, uh, Nicholas outlined it in quite some detail, but if you want to leave it to us, it would just be that, um, do you want us to advance with some of that and we'll use our own discretion as to how far we go with it? Uh, but my belief so is moved. that some of the BIAs would probably appreciate us still doing some of this. So as we come out of the pandemic, the city does look uh, looks beautiful. Not like a dog's breakfast, yeah. 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 Okay, so yeah. we've got a... Okay, so what you just said, uh, Mr. CAO, is the motion that Councillor Thompson is going to make, and it was going to be seconded by Councillor Campbell. Mm -hmm. So did you want to say that one more time for uh, the clerks? Well, Mr. Mayor, on the beautification piece, we will, uh, staff will use this discretion to continue on with the beautification program. Uh, we will use our discretion on some of the areas where it may not uh, be as important, but uh, around our EOC table and the staff uh, that are part of that team, we can make certain decisions with our priority on the higher, uh, the higher visibility BIA, uh, tourist core, main intersections of the city and things of that nature. Okay, um, Councilor Gary. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The other thing that staff could take into consideration, the council might take into consideration, is that this beautification that the city does uh, might be the bulk of the beautification that's done in the city because I'm not sure how much money the different operators and the BIs are going to have this year. You know, if they stay down, uh, shut down much longer, I think that these are things that they just wouldn't be able to afford to do. So if the city doesn't do some, right. uh, there may be nothing in the city. And, and in um, staff's uh, defense, they're very sensitive to the fact our revenues have been cut off significantly. And these EOC meetings, we have them seven days a week, and they've been, uh, no stone's been unturned. And they just wanted you to know the, the detail that they're considering every expenditure. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it, they appreciate the fact that you've got faith in them to make the decisions. But full disclosure, they wanted to show you all the kind of decisions that they're contemplating right now. So we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson. Yes, Councillor Campbell. Just uh, for interest's sake, <clears throat> with all the federal money that's being uh, doled out for uh, keeping people working, does the city of Niagara Falls have any of that revenue coming towards us? Mr. CAO? Thank you, Mr. It's a good question. We're still trying to determine, and Serge Fellow said in his group, we're trying to find out all the programming requirements. I can tell you that we are keeping track of hours and things that we're doing in case we are able to make that application or recoup some of those dollars from the federal government. We are coding it differently, but at this point in time, we're just not sure that we are actually eligible for that fund. Thank you. That's a great question. So we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Campbell. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So you've got unanimous support, Eric, for what you're doing so far. Thank uh, you, Worship. And Appreciate your confidence in us moving forward. Just before you move on, I think you might have one last yeah, preliminary forecast. Yeah, just a question. Yeah, Councillor Strange. Just with Can the, you put um, the mic down in front of you? Yeah. And bring the mic down, because it's really hard for them to hear. It's, it's working, so. <laughs> oh, it's working? No, it's working. Is, Is it, it working? working? Okay. No, just a question with the, um, the seasonal maintenance um, on our city parks. I know they're currently closed, and I see that there's a, I don't know if, if you're recommending that um, I think for, for cutting of the grass and that on our, on our parks, our city parks, because we still have people walking through there to get to trails and uh, the weather is going to be obviously a lot nicer coming up and the grass is going to be growing, you know, quite faster. Are you recommending that we, we go to a 20 day cycle on, on cutting the grass or are you keeping that same cycle of, of maintaining? 
Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we presented the option if we were not to call back seasonal staff, uh, which is a 20 day cycle. Um, I know I can't go a week without mowing my lawn twice sometimes in May, so we're not recommending that. Okay, um, perfect. But, but it does have the repercussions of requiring and relying on those seasonal staff to be called back. So we will make plans to move forward with those. Great, reports. thank you. And the other issue with the longer grass is ticks. ticks. Yeah. And <laughs> we don't have enough challenges. We've got rats, we've got ticks, we've got COVID. So I mean, at least we can help keep the grass down and try to keep some of the issues at bay. Mr. CAO, you wanna weigh in? And thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to that point, and uh, we are going to get some communication out to members of the public through our messaging just to that point, because I I'm think talking Mr. To your mic. Yeah. Mr. Nickel has pointed out two things, uh, and the mayor has mentioned, that you've got the, the health and safety part of it uh, with the longer grass, and that's going to be your, your vermin and your ticks, uh, keeping it safe for somebody to go and use that park, even though the park the park structures aren't open. You can still walk through a park or, you know, kick a ball around. Uh, the second part of that is we've already talked about it is on the, the asset, uh, the asset maintenance, the asset uh, value that if we don't keep up with these parks, you're going to lose a lot of your value. You may lose some parks completely. Um, you know, I draw the analogy that I think most people are still going to cut their front lawns during COVID just to have their properties looking nice and well maintained. And we'd expect the same thing here, and that's the plan that Mr. Nichols put in place. Okay. So uh, the floor is yours again, Mr. Nichol. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So we're moving on to um, section seven of the agenda, is that correct? No, I think your worship- I'm sorry. Are you done with- Yeah, we're- Financial projections. Yeah, you've got- Prelim preliminary Ooh. financial projections, the last slide, second last slide. Okay. Bear with me again. I'm, okay. uh, I just uh, pulled some of the slides. Maybe yours, Tiffany. Um, I don't have the slideshow to share, but I can certainly talk about the. Oh, because we've got the slide in our deck. Shifting through it. There it is. Perfect. Um, so these are really just quite preliminary um, estimates of the lost or at-risk revenue um, that we have for uh, mid-March to about May 31st in most cases. Um, so bank and investment income, obviously this is the biggest one. Council might remember on March 3rd, we <laughs> increased the investment income budget by 800,000 due to favorable bank rates. Well, that's taken a so we're not going to hit that target. Um, that'll be $800,000 of revenue. I don't see us um, bringing in, at least not in the short term. I, I don't know when rates are going to come back again. Uh, we were able to lock away some of our money in GICs and, and save as much income, investment income as we could, but it's still not going to be enough to hit the target that we budgeted. So that is the major one. Uh, Kathy's already sort of covered this. Uh, between arenas and sports fields, arenas were about 340,000 and sports fields were another 22-ish. So that's 368,000 in uh, lost revenue taken all the way to the end of May. Again, if we hit June, which I think we're all expecting, we, we won't be open in June, that, that increases these numbers even more. Uh, the museum was another 7,000. Transit, just for the two months, April and May, uh, Potential lost revenue would be 420,000. And the way we got these, some of these figures was simply basing on 2019's revenue. Um, obviously with transit, nobody's using it. So we're not gonna make the same amount of money that we would have budgeted for based on prior year estimates uh, this year. And then property tax penalties. So with the waivers council has in place right now uh, for, we actually have them in place all the way to June. So I suppose I could have included June in here as an estimate, but that's about $150,000 in lost penalty revenue uh, that we're anticipating. It was 53,000 for April and we're estimating 100,000 for May. So that's about a $1.7 million hit uh, up to May 31st with the exception of the bank interest uh, projected out to the end of the year on our revenues and our operating budget. Um, and this doesn't include um, on your agenda, there's obviously the service center report. There's a couple hundred thousand dollars of expenses there that are operating expenses to, to do some of the cleanup. 
uh, that will have to flow through the operating budget. So we're looking at $2 million right now in revised estimates. And, and as everyone knows, this is an ongoing situation. We don't know when this is going to end, so they are just estimates. Um, but this is part of the reason, I guess, why um, I was asked at a, I think the March 20th council meeting about perhaps opening up a budget. Um, I, I don't think that's going to be favorable. Uh, we'll know more come May, the May 12th meeting. I'll work on a more fulsome report that actually has more of the savings side on the expenses. I needed to get through this meeting so I could understand what some of the service level expectations were going to be from council so we could chart those savings. Um, but I really don't see a scenario where opening up the budget makes the levy go down. It's really more likely it would have to go up, which is, is why I would recommend don't touch it. Just leave it alone and we will manage it with reserves at the end of the year. I'm assuming we'll have a deficit and we will work to manage that with reserves. Um, I wouldn't recommend opening the budget again, but we can have that discussion in May when we get more details in the report. And then the big one, of course, uh, the eyesore there is the casino. So I'm projecting a loss of $5.5 million. I sent out an email earlier today. Um, today is the day we get our first quarter OLG funding and it's about, we got about $4 million this uh, quarter for the January to March quarter. And that reflects about a $1 million loss in, in what we normally would get this time period. Uh, and that's directly reflected, I think, with the 15 days this, the, the casino was closed in March. So the casino money right now, um, I would say that 5.5 million that we're losing right now, that is directly going to affect the 2021 capital budget. But if we lose even more than say 10 million, um, we're now gonna be in trouble for what we subsidize in the operating budget. So hopefully that, that won't happen, but um, that's something on our radar as well that that'll we'll have to be monitoring. And then parking, I've got that as a separate line, not totaled with the operating, because of course parking is a separate budget. Um, but that said, it still can't end in a deficit either as a, as a lower tier, or sorry, as a municipality. We're not allowed to, to end up in a deficit. So we're gonna potentially have to cover uh, final year end deficit in parking with reserves. So we're projecting $185,000 of lost revenue in parking. So that's really just a, a high level look right now. And it doesn't include any of the expected savings from um, some of the things that Eric was already talking about and other and Kathy um, with the staff um, layoffs are not recalling them at the time this time. But um, yeah, any questions? No, uh, no, but the oh wait, Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, not a question, Your Worship, but I mean, I don't think that, that Niagara Falls is unique in any situation. I mean, I know that you sent over that article the other day from the Globe and Mail that talked about other municipalities and everyone's in the same boat right now. So, I mean, I think for the time being, the best thing that we can do is we can keep track of lost revenues and keep track of any increased expenses and, and actually perhaps where we might end up saving money from expenses. And my guess is that all provinces are going to end up going to the province. Uh, sorry, all municipalities are going to end up going to the province and, and uh, you know, be pitching the Premier on, you know, helping out with uh, with everyone's situation. So, I mean, I think we just have to keep track right now and then, you know, and then, I guess, formulate a game plan when, when all this goes back to normal. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Mr. CAO. I just wanted to thank uh, everybody on the uh, Zoom for the, the presentation. Uh, at that May 12th meeting, what we'd hope to do is uh, Ms. Clark is going to be able to give you a more fulsome breakdown on where we are with all those revenues. We'll have a little bit better picture because we'll have a whole month uh, through the end of April. Um, and uh, Mr. Dark will be able to provide you just a little bit of a, a picture of what we've been doing on, on the staffing front uh, with recalls or lack of recalls, certainly the direction today from council give us a little bit better idea of what we have to do. Uh, and just so council knows, there have been a number of things that we've been doing at the staffing level already. You've heard today's presentation about a number of redeployments we've had to do. I think there's about 30 uh, employees that have been redeployed from what we consider to be slightly non-essential tasks over to more important tasks that we deemed essential to help out, for example, the cemetery or, or municipal works. Um, and that's been very helpful. Um, and I think we're something like 60 or 65 jobs that right now are not filled or vacant. 
uh, that we've not filled uh, to help with the situation of, of not having those additional wage workers. So we're waiting to fill any of those jobs until we come out of, uh, out of the pandemic and uh, that's certainly going to help the bottom line as well. But Mr. Dark uh, will be able to give you a more fulsome review on that on the 12th along with uh, Ms. Clark's detailed uh, better picture as to where we are in the revenue front for the uh, May 12th meeting. Do you need any motion on the projections, financial projections or? Uh, I think just at this point, if you want to just receive them for information. Okay, motion by budget chair, Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange that we receive the preliminary financial projections for information. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, thank you. So thank you for uh, item 6.2 and now I guess we move on to reports, item seven and um, first is 7.1 annual statement of remuneration and expenses of city council and uh, individual councilors. So I don't know if there's any uh, Receiving file for information. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. I'm sorry, by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo that it be received. Yes, uh, Councillor Cario. Well, Your Worship, I've had in the past people that have read this have asked about uh, how many council meetings we have and uh, the attendance and that this would be a good place to illustrate it. The mm -hmm. council meetings that we have and the attendance would be a good place to have that shown. I don't okay. know what the other counselors think. So do you want a report for the next meeting kind of thing with the attendance? Well, it depends what's on council. I, I, I would be okay with me. I, I would make that motion and see if it flies. Okay. Anyways. Would you make that a part of that motion, uh, Councillor Pietrangelo, or would you <coughs> want it to be a separate motion? Fine by me. Okay. Uh, and you're okay with it? The second, uh, who did the second again? Oh, it was Councillor. No, Councillor Thompson Tom, made the motion. Thompson okay. You comfortable motion. with that too? Adding in the attendance, uh, the council meeting attendance as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion uh, to the motion? Okay, then we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, item 7.2, Municipal Service Center Site Remediation and Repairs. Uh, Mr. Nickel, I think you're back on again to give us an update on what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so it, it, I'll give you a sh very short recap of the report and I'll try to give a few statements to address some of the questions that have been coming my way. Um, so just to recap, the, oh, since the uh, end of February, staff have been taking immediate corrective actions in order to mitigate um, the consequences of the fuel leak and spill at the uh, Municipal Service Centre. And the two priorities we've kept in mind at all times is worker health and safety and the limitation of environmental risks. So we prepared a report for your consideration that focuses on implementation of very basic items that are necessary to continue operations and to continue operations at the facility in the short term. Um, this by no means is a Cadillac solution. Um, I've been in the building a number of times in the past few weeks, and I can tell you that there's significant upgrades if we were to maintain occupancy in that building um, from electrical to fire suppression systems, roof replacement, um, lighting, and, and the list goes on. Um, so while we're talking about that, I should also mention that um, what is not included in the report, because the report deals about the recovery and, and the finances needed to maintain operation at the service centre, uh, we have indeed um, made some steps towards a replacement facility with our development charges bylaw approved in 2019 includes a background report uh, with a new service center uh, flagged at approximately 36 million dollars um, but 84% um, of those costs to replace the service center would be coming from development charges so that is an item that is a placeholder and is receiving um, financing on every development application <clears throat> We know that price is a moving target, and at this point, we're working with um, some preliminary um, consultants to look at footprints for the new building and acreage needs, because we know that when we are to move to a new facility, we want to get it right. We want to have it last for the city um, for the needs of growth um, for at least another 50, 75 years. So we're not moving intentionally um, with the knee-jerk reaction into a new facility. And we know that if we are to move to a new facility, there's likely a three to four year time frame uh, from land acquisition to occupancy. 
So um, that said, the existing site on Stanley Avenue and the investments that we're requesting will indeed serve the purposes of the city uh, for a future north end satellite facility while we move our maintenance center um, as identified in the dcs um, any investments that we're suggesting here in terms of the new fuel tanks and hvac systems wouldn't really be considered throwaway because they'll serve uh, the current location um, for whatever purpose it's repurposed for or, or even could be moved uh, and relocated to the new uh, service center um, so I just wanted to leave with you, from my perspective, the timing of this is critical. We have been um, fortunate to be able to use the Gale Centre, but I don't know if fortunate is the right word right now because that there's a reason why we've been able to use the Gale Centre, and that's because it's been closed. Um, if we have no alternative when the Gale Centre opens for our staff, um, we will be significantly impacted in delivering service. And the public relies on our ability to have our equipment and our staff ready to tackle challenges as they come up. Um, that facility is an operations center is very integrated. So we have multiple units operating out of there. We do repairs on um, fire equipment and we um, have stores and stock equipment so that we can go out and, and address needs in the community. So um, we can't just sever part of that operations center and, uh, and, and build it elsewhere while we try to maintain operations there. So, um, you know, I, I think at that point, we believe that there are really no reasonable alternatives to relocating all of the offices, equipment and storage um, that are currently impacted. And uh, hence this report has come forward without any alternatives, but um, your worship, that's just a brief overview and I'm more than happy to answer some questions. Okay, Council, uh, there's your update on the Municipal Centre uh, from Mr. Nickel. Yes, uh, Councillor, i uh, got Councillor Lococo and Councillor Cario. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I had the opportunity to speak to Mr. Nickel today and I had a few questions for him and he, he gave me some ideas about why there was only one alternative in comparison to usually we receive many alternatives and which ones are better and which ones aren't. I guess one of my questions, Mr. Nickel, um, through the Mayor, we talked about uh, it being three to four years until we get to a, a new, uh, finding the land and moving a new um, service center. What is the price of the upgrades that we'll need to do on the current service center? Because a, a lot of it talked about end of life, like you said, the roof and, and those types of things. How much is that going to cost us between now and three to four years when we get a new service center elsewhere? Uh Thanks, Councillor. It's a great question, and um, I don't believe we have very firm estimates on what the additional upgrades would be because they depend on um, some of the decisions in terms of timing. So, uh, if the the new service center um, was going to be ten year time frame, then there are some investments that need to be done to maintain basic operational efficiency and health and safety. Um, so for the next three to four years, I, I wouldn't expect the ongoing maintenance items to be any more than was traditionally invested in the facility. And the work that we're doing right now um, will have a, a investment potential much longer than five years. So that, by that, I mean we can keep it in the building and, and allow it to be useful for future uses or move it. Um, but. Uh, I mean, some of the other items I mentioned that could be upgraded, like electrical, roofs, lighting, um, those are things that we can press pause on and come back to Council on an annual basis in our, our annual operating uh, budgets to rec make some recommendations. But certainly we don't want to move forward on any significant expenses uh, unless they're absolutely necessary. So. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Nickel. I, I guess where I'm going is that we're looking at a $2 million price tag and it's basically a Band-Aid. Um, we, we are looking for land for the service center. I guess my other question, um, as you said, fortunately and unfortunately, we are using other buildings to have our staff in there. If we do come out of this pandemic, say in, in, in June, when will the service center be livable that our, our staff can go back and if it's not at that point where are we going to put our staff do we have other buildings through you mr mayor um, it, it's a great question and that's the um the real driving force for us to move this as along as quick as possible 
Uh, we have quotes right now to do some uh, floor ceiling remediation, which will cap the, the uh, fuel that we know in the vapor that's underneath the floor uh, from um, returning in back into the building. So I think we're looking at a phased approach to get back into the office. For one, the office, um, we're back in this week and uh, we have other work areas like our environmental services. Once the floor has been sealed, they can come back to work, albeit respecting some physical distance uh, changes. And then our maintenance garage will be one of the last areas because it needs to have a, a fuller, um, more comprehensive upgrade of its HVAC system. But we could still come back in and operate um, those activities that are not contingent on HVAC improvements. Um, if we can move quickly on this, then and we will make sure that we lock in those contractors who've given us prices and um, we'll get back in before uh, the end of summer. Um, that's, uh, that's really the, the, the best time frame we have right now. And uh, we, we do certainly wanted to make sure that council was aware there's a financial impact. And if that can be approved, then we can make those decisions to move as quickly as possible. A couple more questions, okay. please. I, I asked Mr. Nickel about um, tearing down that facility. And if we were going to invest in a new facility, would it go there? And he did express to me that the land is too small for our needs. We've significantly grown the city and the service center right now is just too small. So I wanted to put that out there in case people were wondering. Um, I was wondering if there was any insurance, um, I don't know if we're able to answer that, if there's any insurance claims that can help us with, with the cost of this, because we've already put in, I think you said 800,000 and we're looking to go to 2.2 million. Um, can insurance help with any of that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The uh, risk management, management is checking the insurance coverage out. It's something we'll have to report back on to council later. I guess my final question is, I, I just want to make sure that we have no other options than spending $2.2 .2 million on it the way it is to get people back in that we do not have any other alternatives. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Yes, Mr. CAO. And, and I think just to that point, uh, <coughs> Mr. Mayor, um, we do envision that uh, regardless of what happens to a new service center, uh, and if I could just point out, uh, our original time frame on the service center was probably out around the 2025. Uh, we had our uh, uh, development charges uh, update uh, that was about a year ago, uh, and that put a price tag at a new service center and property at somewhere around $35 million. Uh, so, you know, our belief is that spending a couple of million dollars here to get us through over a few more years. We still, I think, in the long term, as Mr. Nichols indicated, I think we see that there will be a, regardless of where that new service center ends up, I think we will need a presence somewhere in the north end for a yard. It currently has our salt dome. It currently has a water uh, haulage uh, facility there. So we still see a presence, what that ultimately looks like. But uh, I'm not sure we see that this is going to be money that's just uh, wasted. It's going to be money that we're going to be able to utilize over the next number of years. And still longer term, we believe we'll have a presence there. And right now with a, a new uh, service center, that was our time frame under the uh, bylaw that this council approved, I think it was last year, uh, on the uh, new development charges. And that was the time frame and the, the cost estimate. Just so you can put it in perspective as to what we're asking you to here to spend today. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Councilor Kerry. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> Mr. Todd answered some of my questions. You know, we're looking at $35 million minimum to build a new facility. And I don't look at that building that's there today as the money being put in is wasted. That's a substantial structure. It's a good property. Um, the other thing I think, just a comment, is um, the city has no choice but to remediate the site. So that money is a given. We as a city cannot leave a site contaminated. No matter what we're going to do with it, I think we're obligated to fix it and to clean it and put it back so that it's usable, saleable, whatever. And the other thing I was gonna say was, I don't think over the years that I've been here, we spent a lot of money on that facility. And we have not spent a lot of money on that facility. So it doesn't owe us a lot of money. Um, the other thing is too, you know, we just finished building a brand new building in the Gale Center. There was a lot of maintenance. 
we spent a lot of money on the Gale Center, and it's a brand new building. So this is not too bad considering the age of this building. Um, the other thing I was wondering, uh, and Mr. Todd has touched on it, is you know, considering how the city comes out of this crisis that we're in now and how the community comes out of this, it might get pushed down the road a little bit. I mean, depends on what kind of financial position we're in. You know, if the casino doesn't bounce back, we don't have that big chunk of money coming in, uh, we're gonna have our hands full mitigating the financial issues that we're gonna be faced in the future. So I'm not sure how well it would sit with the taxpayers for the city to invest uh, $35 million if we're pushed back financially over the next year and a half or two years. So I think we're doing the right thing. I think that the city's done a great report, done a great job on mitigating the expenses and getting, being able to get this facility back into a usable condition it's the only thing we could do at this stage of the game, in my estimation. And I do have a fair amount of construction experience. <laughs> yes, you do. Thank you for that. Councilor, uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, the, the two items I wanted to mention were kind of touched on. The one was just in regards to insurance. Um, I, I, I guess I would look at it from uh, the standpoint of a homeowner. If I had a pipe burst in my house, um, I would call my insurance and, you know, they would send an adjuster over and say, okay, you know, there's been water damage here, there's been water damage there as a result of the pipe burst. Um, this is how much we'll cover you for. Does the city not operate under the same premise as, uh, as a homeowner? Like, are, are our policies different uh, because it's a corporate policy um, as opposed to a homeowner? Um, that, that was my only question because, I, I, I mean, I guess I heard Mr. Todd say, you know, risk management is looking into it. Um, we've known for a while that this has happened, so have, have we not had any word back from our insurance provider yet? Mr. Uh, Mr. Todd. Well, I think unless uh, Ms. Clark has more recent information than I have, but... Um... Tiffany, do you have any, uh, any updates on that uh, at this point? Um, not necessarily more recent information, but we did reach out to our insurer immediately when it happened. Um, we did go through our policy, um, but we're not covered for environmental damage on our own property, uh, only if it travels to a third party's property. Um, we did look into uh, other types of insurance we might be covered, and they, the insurer is waiting uh, for a little bit more information on the timeline. It, but it is unlikely based on a conversation with the insurer that we will be covered for this. And I think a lot of it has to do with, we cannot pinpoint the date of loss. We don't know when this started happening. Okay, so. We are still investigating it, but um, it's not likely. Okay, thank you for that. Yep. Okay, and, and if it's not written into our policy, then it's not written into our policy, Your Worship. Um, that was kind of the answer that I was looking for. The other comment I was going to make, and I think a number of people have already brought it up, um, is that the idea of having a new municipal uh, center um, is, is not really a new idea. Uh, I know Mr. Todd touched on the fact that uh, City Council did pass our 2019 development charges bylaw last year, and I think there was a price tag of $35 million for a new facility. Uh, $27 million of it um, is going to come from development charges. So the planning stages on having a new uh, municipal facility are already in the works, Your Worship. We're just not there yet. So um, I am in support of the motion. So when the vote is called, I'll vote in favor. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so we're looking for a motion for the recommendation. Uh, Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. If there's no further discussion or um, questions, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item 7.3, uh, I think Councilor Peter Angelo, is this yeah. the one you asked uh, for the Garner Estate Speed Control Review? Yeah, so Your Worship, there's, um, I mean, there was a big speed control review that was done out in the Gardner area, and I know that um, there is in particular one resident who wanted to speak on it. Uh, because of the situation that we're in, um, that resident can't come down because this is not a public meeting. So the only thing I was gonna ask was, um, that the report be deferred until such time uh, that the resident can actually speak on it. Whether we figure that out through, um, I guess, video conferencing or we actually get to the point where we're inviting the public back to City Hall, 
um, perhaps then we can deal with this report. So if it could be deferred until then, that would be great. And I'll make the motion. motion to defer yep. by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, it's not debatable. So, and, th and that's until you have to have a time frame. So you're suggesting until we're able to have the public address us. Yeah. Either through uh, technology or in person. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Consent agenda. Uh, did you want to lift one, Councillor? Okay, go ahead. Uh, which ones did you want to lift? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to lift RNC 2020-06, the Alistair Young Arts and Culture Endowment Fund. Okay, hang on one sec. Just that one? Yes, please. Okay. So motion by Councillor Peter An uh, by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angel that we move the remainder of the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. And then Councillor Lacoca wanted to address the Alistair Young Arts and Culture Endowment Fund recipient. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to congratulate Sky Kwa. She has been very active in our community through activism, through her indigenous community, through arts, uh, very, very involved for the last few years. And there's an Alistair Young Award, and it's awarded to an artist, a local artist. And I just wanted to congratulate her since I'm sure she would have probably been, been here if it was an open council meeting, but I wanted to bring congratulations from the Arts and Culture Committee, which Mr. Campbell, with Counsel Councillor Campbell sits on, and um, our congratulations to her. Okay, that's Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you for that. So do you need a motion to actually move the report? I'll move it now, Your Worship. Uh, the one, the Alistair yeah, Young well, one? Yeah. Was it lifted? Uh, it was lifted, yes. Okay, then I'll make a motion to approve it. Okay, and the, we'll follow up with that. Councilor Peter Angelo and Councilor LaCoco. Uh, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous as well. Thank you for that. So, whoops. What is going on here? Uh, give me one second. My... My screen is doing something funny, okay. Okay, communications and comments of the city clerk, uh, 9.1. Uh, we've got, uh, this is the recommendation that we negotiated with the region on waste management. So okay, we'll so mo motion by Councillor Pierangel, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski, that we approve the recommendation from the region. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. Item 9.2, uh, Regional Emergency Operations Center update. So there's a number of updates, recommendations for information that we receive. Moved by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski that we receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously, thank you. Item 9.3, Regional Various Correspondence, recommendation that we receive and file. Moved by Councillor Campbell, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Thank you. Item 9.4, Town of Midland resolution regarding financial aid plan. I'm not sure if they told, if I understand this correctly, but they want all their property taxes paid for. <laughs> I'm behind that one. Uh, yes, Councillor Cario. Okay. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Strange that we receive and file. All those in favor? All right, that's unanimous. Skyline Living. Uh, there's a recommendation that council call upon the federal government to increase the funding to families that need rental housing security. Move the recommendation. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Lacoco. All those in favor? <laughs> and that's unanimous. Thank you. We have a flag raising request for e. Italian Heritage Month in so June. E. And that's e. motion by <laughs> Councillor Stranges, <laughs> seconded by <laughs> Councillor Lacoco. Okay, and the Council Coco has got a, a motion, or a question, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just wondering, because it's June 5th, if we're still closed, will there actually be a flag raising? Will we still have staff put, put the flag up? Well, we still have the staff here. Um, any idea, Mr. Yeah, so we're still gonna, yeah, we'll still have the flag raising. Thank you. We'll just keep our distance, that's all. And it's hard for Italians, right? So they uh, like to get close. <laughs> Is that right, Councilor Stranges? Mm -hmm. That's right. Did we call that vote? All those in favor? All right, thank you. Um, item 9.7, uh, closed in camera. Oh yeah, so we received our letter from the Ombudsman uh, in regard to the complaint about our uh, in-camera meeting around FedDev. And uh, as you'll see, we received a letter of full exoneration that we didn't do anything wrong. We did things following proper procedure, uh, both our procedural uh, bylaw and the Municipal Act. So there was no wrongdoing. So. That was good news. 
Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo that we receive. All those in favor, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Resolutions, uh, Mr. Clerk, or do we have any resolutions? Okay, so we're into the bylaws. Motion by first, second, and third reading, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski, that the bylaws be given a first, second, and third reading. And I did have a question on one. Oh, but before we call the vote, he did have a question on one. Yeah. What was it? So, Your Worship, uh, 202039 uh, dealt with, I believe, uh, council member appointments. And I, I noticed that there are a couple vacancies, or that's what it shows. Um, I think the Accessibility Advisory Committee uh, it says does not have a rep right now. Property standards, and I'm not sure whether or not they actually have meetings, doesn't have a rep right now. And then I couldn't tell if uh, transportation was linked into transportation and linking Niagara, if that's all one, or if they were two separate committees. Yeah, if they're two separate committees, then, then the transportation steering committee doesn't have a rep right now either. So I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's, three committees that are um, open um, yeah. should, uh, oh, you're on accessibility? Was passed okay. four or five months ago. Maybe. And okay. transportation, so is that the go. one, Mr. CAO? That's that the that regional happened? one, right? Okay, so that's not the regional one? Okay. So maybe, um, maybe the clerk can send out an email, yeah. and then if any of council wants to, uh, you know, join on the two committees that are open, um, then we can update it again so that we have a full slate. That's all. That's a great. Do you want to add that to your motion of sure. approving the bylaws? Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, approving the giving the bylaws for second and third reading, and also communicating to council about the two vacancies of council appointments. Yeah. Okay. And you're good with that. The second or two, uh, Councillor Dabrowski. Okay. Great. We'll call the vote. All those in favor. Okay. And that's unanimous. Um, new business. Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, City of Niagara Falls would have passed a, an interim control bylaw in regards to cannabis almost a year ago. Uh, based on the Planning Act, the rules state that, you know, we have a one-year time frame to get a report back to Council and that we can possibly extend it for another year should Council wish. I'm wondering whether or not those rules still apply uh, during COVID-19 mm -hmm. and what's going on. So, um, are we still adhering to the same deadlines, Your Worship? Uh, um, do, do we know from a planning perspective? I know that all LPAT uh, meetings have been pushed off. I know that there's a lot of uh, uh, different, um, um, I guess, uh, judicial matters that have been put off as well. Um, so, I'm wondering whether or not the Planning Act would fall under that. Ed? So, maybe we'll ask uh, Mr. Lustig our uh, former CAO and solicitor, if he would have any advice on, so our intern control bylaw that we put in place for the uh, marijuana growing uh, was one year. And the question is now that we're coming up on a year with the COVID crisis and the provincial order, would that be delayed further in the same way that LPAT hearings and these types of matters have been delayed and extended? Uh, yes, I believe that the um, orders that the government have issued include uh, suspension of timelines with respect to Planning Act limitations. So I'll check further into it, but my, um, my view is at this stage that uh, that time limitation uh, would be suspended. Okay, that's great. That's great. Thank you for that, Mr. Lessig. Okay. Any other new business? No. Check his temperature again, Chief. We got <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other new business? Uh, Councillor Thompson? Yes. Um, this goes back uh, a long time. Um, if you ha asked me a couple of years ago, what is uh, 4G, I wouldn't know what you're talking about. Although I did hear many times about, oh, cell phones, uh, you could have uh, brain cancer or problems with that. Um, and I have been uh, just uh, inundated with uh, emails and people talking to me and calling me about 5G. Uh, we uh, had a little discussion here about it. Uh, we 
I, I think if you start reading some of the material about uh, what it, uh, the effects could be, cancer, uh, all kinds of different problems, I don't know. I'm not an expert at this, but I have been inundated so much that, uh, uh, and we've discussed it here, and we went to the point of inviting somebody from uh, Health Canada to come here and tell us what their feelings are with respect to 5G. And they just declined. We didn't hear another word about it. And uh, I'm still getting uh, weekly uh, people <clears throat> sending me emails with all kinds of material with respect to uh, the problems with respect to this. And they ask me, where do you stand on this? I don't know where I stand. I'm a progressive individual. I want to have the best of everything, but I really have some concerns that this council has not been informed enough about 5G. So I'm wondering if we could have a report from staff or some experts or somebody to come here and uh, at a future council meeting to uh, tell us what we should be doing because we've been criticized uh, in several emails for not uh, speaking about it, for not making a decision with respect to the concerns. So I would just like to refer to staff to come back and give us some information with respect to uh, are we in favor of this? Are we have concerns? Mm -hmm. Are all these people crazy that uh, are sending, uh, they're very responsible individuals. You get sometimes 20 of them making their comments about the concerns. So all I want to do is be informed if we're, we're moving ahead with uh, 5G, we're doing the right thing. So I would make a motion, refer it to staff. Now, did we not already get a report from staff on 5G? That's what I thought. Yes, yes. yes Mayor, we, uh, through you, uh, we already had a report, and if you recall, council had asked us to uh, get, um, help me out, Mr. Clerk, the, uh, the federal uh, oh health Canada health Canada reps down here as an appointment yeah. uh, to speak to us and unfortunately health Canada sent us some documentation and then they refused to come and speak to council they said here's the documentation uh, we're not coming mr. clerk that's had to be a couple months ago I think or several months ago so anyways we've, we've had mr. mayor we have had that report here before the other part I can suggest to you what's going on, because I've got those emails too, but this is global phenomenon. There's a conspiracy theory that COVID has been spread because of 5G. And if you do some research on it, you see it's complete conspiracy theory. There's no science behind it whatsoever. I don't, I don't believe that. No, but that's where this started. And a couple of Hollywood people picked up, I think Woody Harrelson was one of them, and they tweeted it and it picked up some steam you know, because he's got a lot of scientific background and I guess he felt he'd weigh in on it. So the fact remains, that's what's come out. I've had people say it's been banned in California, banned here, and you go, you look it up, it hasn't been banned in any of these places. California's full rollout, so's Europe, so's all these countries. Yes, they're doing the research on it. What I've read, because I did spend a couple of days reading tons of articles on this from reputable news sources, not one-sided opinionated people, and what they're consistently saying is, there's no evidence, none, to say that it's bad. But then what these conspiracies are saying, prove to me that it can't cause cancer. So they're asking for you to do the reverse. Well, prove that you know speaking on your 4G phone doesn't cause cancer. Because if 5G causes cancer, so does 4G. It's all the same, just different frequency. So that's the thing you gotta decide. Stop using your remote control, your garage door openers, your Wi-Fi in your house. Stop using everything. Because the one lady that came here would only come here if we shut the Wi-Fi off. Because she said that's all part of the same problem. Well, we got to decide. Is that where we're going? Because that's not where the world's going. So we got to decide. Are we going to be uh, an island of no uh, moving forward on our 
So, I mean, we can get, we've already had a staff report. I don't know what more we could bring forward. As a result of the staff report, we asked for um, Health Canada yeah. to come and we never had anything back since then. So I would like to... Um, re-invite them? Do you want to re-invite them or do you want to... No, I would just want to have the staff give us confidence that uh, we're not making a decision without having solid knowledge about what's happening. That's all I'm looking for. Okay. A uh, motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Lococo. Yes, sir. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to review what we did back in November, there were three experts that came to the McBain Center and they, they presented and then they came here with a very mini presentation uh, to talk about 5G and then that's when the idea of inviting Health Canada to come up to get their ideas. If you would like, I would like to reach out to um, those experts again and if we can get some more confirmation about um, any movement from November but We've already to had now. those experts. We don't have, have to have them repeating. The same so, pitch. No. Yeah, exactly. Because no. like, the one wasn't an expert. He's the former president of Microsoft. No. So he's not a science expert, right? He was a president. So I think maybe accounting background or something. So I think we've had one side. We haven't had the other side of the argument. I think that was our concern. That's why we wanted Health Canada here. I personally wouldn't support hearing the same presentation again. If Health Canada, if we can get them to come here, what if they won't come here? Where do we go well, with that? I don't know because every community in Canada is going to invite Health Canada. I think that's what they're worried about because they're going to go around trying to defend uh, a technology they're already endorsing. So they're going to have to go around and prove because what they're being asked to do is prove it doesn't cause it. It's like prove chocolate cake doesn't pr cause this. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. To, to tell someone, prove that this is the case, that's hard. I don't know how they would do it. I'm guessing that's why they sent us all the documentation and said we're, we support it, but we're not coming. I don't know how we're gonna get, I can, we can invite them again, but I think what Councillor Thompson's asking is, let's get staff to do maybe a more comprehensive report, knowing that they're not gonna come, yeah. and we can include the 5G information that they did send along, and who knows, maybe they'll come. I don't know, I'm guessing during COVID they're not gonna come right now, I'm thinking this isn't a priority, but we can invite them out again. And if there's any new information, yeah, would be it, uh, absolutely. As, if as there's well. anything new, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so we've got we've got the motion seconded. Any discussion to the motion, Councillor Kerry? Well, Your Worship, you mentioned something about many of the big cities have it. Maybe uh, through some of the connections we have, you could just get hold of some peers as related to some of the big cities. Maybe they would send you gratis the information that they had before they made the decision. Information. Any information that they'd have, rather than having our staff going and going and uh, reinventing the wheel, maybe there's information out there that some big cities already done. They've already done this research with a much bigger budget than we have, so maybe they'd be prepared to share their side as to why they did it. And I'm sure they heard all the naysayers and the people with the, the you know the tin caps on their heads coming to their meetings too. So you know. Do we have any other questions or comments? And the nice thing I like is uh, Mr. Oatley is here in the room, so he's hearing all council's comments, so he hears it direct. Yes, uh, Councillor DeBrosky. Sir, what was the motion again that Councillor Thompson had made? So that we're going to ask staff to come back with a further more report, information. Uh, more information, including the Health Canada information, and as Councillor Carroll suggested, reach out to some other uh, cities that have already brought 5G in. Uh, they're building it right now as we speak. You know, It's going to make your phone work. It's going to be 100 times the speed. And what the big concern is privacy issues privacy. because data, because it's facial recognition data. And they're saying that China, you know, they can identify anybody within seconds. It's they okay for us older people. We don't look the same. <laughs> the wrinkles change the looks. So that was the basic motion to ask them, uh, to staff to come back with a further report and re-invite uh, Health Canada. To Which is great. I, we've already received a report. I'm not sure rehashing the same statistics and health statistics, but I, I love the idea that Councillor Kerry would mention of contacting other municipalities, whether it be in Canada or, or the United States, to see what they've implemented already. I just don't want to rehash what we've already researched and waste staff's time. Okay. So you heard that? So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Councillor Kerry. Just a quick question, Your Worship. Um, on this... Um, uh, Zoom? Yeah, Zoom. Is it going to, the uh, voice, is the voice and the picture going to kind of get together at some point, <laughs> or is that the way it operates? <coughs> is that just the quality that that's what it is? It's a little confusing when Eric's a half a second behind. 
when he's talking, when I'm hearing it and watching. So we'll ask Mr. Oatley if he can. Right. So what we're actually seeing is a you're participating in Zoom. So our video that you're seeing here is actually going out to the internet, being processed, and coming back in, and then displaying on the screen. So it's everything does move at the speed of light, but there's still a distance oh, there. So if five G would help. However, this is pretty close to as real time as you would get. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Any other? Yes, Mr. Clerk. So just to follow up on that, I, I know there was about a one or two second delay, and you might be hearing it. I feel like I'm hearing it from that side of the room. If somebody has their iPad open with Zoom on, you're getting a bit of an echo. And what I've done is I've just plugged in my earphones into my iPad, so I'm not hearing that echo throughout the room. So there's a bit of small delay. Um, but we're not seeing anything too major, and that's why we've asked people to speak a little slower. Uh, if you do have a device going at a future meeting, um, and we're in this room at a future meeting, and that's to be determined, I suppose, but uh, it may help just to bring some earbuds, because I'm finding we can't turn the volume all the way down on your iPad, all right down to zero, or perhaps maybe not even on your phone. So earbuds seem to get rid of that echo. So. One of the cameras that we added, actually, we don't have earbuds for, and so that's why it's actually <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, so that will be fixed for our next meeting. Oh, good. Now, one question: Are you watching Zoom on yours, or are you watching? You have two. Oh, you got two going. Yeah. Oh, okay, because the rest of us, agenda, none of us have Zoom on, do we? Or we're all watching. We're we've, watching I don't have Zoom. Yeah, we all have the agenda. Okay, so maybe it's one of these phones that I'm hearing. It's the one up top, actually. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Oh, okay. I keep your, yeah, I keep hearing. I was gonna say I'm hearing it too. Yeah. I don't know where I'm hearing it. Okay. Uh, the clerk is saying is that you can turn your volume down, but it only goes so loud. So right. it's as low as it goes, but we have to get a second set of earbuds to turn it off. So a little bit of annoyance in this meeting, but it will be fixed for the next meeting. Good. So is there any other new business? Okay, we have to go in camera. So we need uh, resolution to go in camera uh, downstairs, committee room two. Yeah, I guess do we have to go down in camera downstairs, uh, Mr. Oh. oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Then they can clear things up. Okay, so I need a motion to go in camera. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. So we're not coming back here. No. Uh, do we have to rise and report though? I'm assuming that uh, based on what we're speaking about, it's just direction of staff, so I don't anticipate the rise and report. Okay, okay. Uh, so do we need a motion to adjourn? Yeah, we'll make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 We have to leave our electronic devices, so we do have to come back here. Yes, yeah, we have to come back, yeah. So motion for adjournment. Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? All right, super, all right.